Ooh, nice and warm. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Good morning, Utica. Glad to see everyone here this morning as we gather for worship. Uh, if this is your first time worshiping with us, we are glad that you're here, and we hope that you will find a way to let us know about you. Uh, there are some yellow cards in the chair backs in front of you. Uh, you can also find those out in the main lobby. Uh, or you can go to uh, the website that is listed at uticabaptist.com forward slash guest. Uh, you can just do the online registration there. We would just love to know who you are and how we can follow up with you to see what needs you might have and what questions you might have about the church. But we are thrilled that you are here to worship with us this morning, and we are thrilled that we get to start our worship with baptism. Uh, we have two different people that were baptism this morning, and the first one is Alyssa Smith. <laughs> it is the water is not cold this morning not at all is it so that is not a <laughs> no. that is not a that is not a cold water face is that a hot water face yes yes a little hot this morning that's all right uh, we will come out we will come out nice and steamed and ironed and we'll be ready for the rest of the day after our spa treatment today this is Alyssa Smith, and she is the daughter of Cody and uh, Alex, uh, Allie Smith. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a little while since, since Alyssa prayed to trust in Jesus. Is that right? It's been a couple of months now. And uh, Miss Karen has had the opportunity to follow up with her and talk with her about the gospel and make sure that she has a, a right understanding of what she is symbolizing here. So Alyssa, just to remind you, there's... There's nothing spiritual going on right here. You're not about to get saved. You're about to get baptized, which is a picture on the outside of what has already happened on the inside, right? Uh, we, she has some family members here today, and I'm going to ask you if you are a family member or if you have helped to participate in teaching Alyssa about the love of the Lord, whether it be in Awana or as a Sunday school teacher, or a VBS leader, if you would just uh, raise your hand right now, if you have helped to participate. And you see hands going up uh, all over the room there. Lots of people that God has used to help bring you to Jesus. Alyssa, are you here this morning because you admit that you're a sinner and that you need a Savior? Do you believe that Jesus is that Savior because He's the Son of God who lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, and was raised to life three days later. Do you believe that? And is this baptism part of your confession that Jesus is now Savior and Lord of your life? It's my privilege to baptize you now, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of His resurrection life. <laughs> All right. It is a little bit hot. Anne, Anne vouches for that. Uh, this is Anne Hainish, uh, and Anne has been attending our church for several months now. And uh, the reason Andrea is up here with her is because Andrea was a co-worker at Seneca Middle School and invited her here to the church. Uh, and Anne is one of those people uh, who has been in and out of church uh, most of her life. But on Sunday morning, May the 1st, the Lord brought conviction to her heart that she had never actually given her life to Jesus. And so you might have been here that morning. She came forward and she trusted in Christ for salvation. Uh, she realized that it's not, it's not about going to church. It's not about doing good things. Uh, we're going to be looking at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 a little bit later this morning. It reminds us that salvation is not by works so that no one can boast. It is, it is the gift of God, and Anne received that gift on Sunday morning, May the 1st. Uh, Anne, are you here this morning because you admit that you're a sinner and that you need a Savior? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus is that Savior, having lived a perfect life for us, taken our sins upon Himself, and died for them on the cross, and then was raised to life three days later? Do you believe that? Yes. And is this baptism part of your confession that Jesus is Savior and Lord of your life? Yes. It is now my privilege to baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, 
raised to walk in the newness of his resurrection life. Pray with me as we continue in worship this morning. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for what you continue to do as you transform lives by the power of the gospel. Uh, Lord, we pray for Alyssa and for Anne as they continue to walk with Jesus and learn more and more each day what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, Lord, I pray especially for Cody and Allie and for all the Sunday school teachers and Awana leaders that will continue to show Alyssa what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And Father, that's what we want to do today. We want to follow you. We want to trust you. We want to learn more about you uh, so we can live more to please you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Hey, everyone. Um, I've been in Greece for the past 10 days, and it's been really awesome. Uh, However, um, I am dazed and confused this morning from jet lag, and I also have vertigo. Okay, so if I fall down, just pick me up. Okay, I'll be all right. Um, I cannot put together coherent thoughts either. And so we're just going to sing this morning. Uh, That's what we're going to do. I will say thank you. Thank you for allowing me to go um, to Greece. It was life changing for me. Life changing. Not in the sense of, oh, I feel so sorry for these people. But in the sense of, I needed that reality check of my spoiled life in America. And I'm so excited to have the opportunity to share with you guys what the Lord did while we were there. I can't do it right now because I can't put it together in my head, okay? But I would love to, if you gave for my trip, if you gave for the, the, the church's trip for Dondi, for Elena, for John, I would love to sit down and have coffee with you in your house. I would love to have dinner with you I would love to spend time and just tell you what the Lord did because everything is different now. The songs that we sing, different. It's not a a pity. It's a, my eyes have been opened. And so, yeah, it's going to be a great morning of worship. As we were talking to the missionaries over there, they talked about what they missed the most about being in America. And it was the singing together and their heart language. We talked about heart language a lot. And so what a privilege it is that we get to be here today and sing songs together in our language. Um, So this morning, we're going to start with Be Thou My Vision. So if you'll stand with me and sing. I have this microphone stand here so I don't fall over. All right, so it's going to be good. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy prayer. Thou my wisdom, be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great father, and I thy true son. Thou with me dwell. Rich 
riches I need, riches I need not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only put first in my heart. I keep my treasure thou art oh god oh god be my everything be my delight be jesus my glory my soul satisfied oh god be my everything be Still be, still be my vision, O ruler of all. So part of what I asked you guys to pray for um, when we were overseas was for dreams and visions. Um, and so I'm, the stories of how God revealed himself to these Persian believers is incredible. And a lot of that was through dreams and visions that they had. And so, while we're worshiping this morning, continue to pray for those believers. Pray for yourselves that you would see who God is if you don't recognize that already. Um, I can't remember the name of the next song, so will we please pull that up? Thank you. Um, so we're going to sing together, 10,000 Reasons Bless the Lord. Um, let's sing this together. Sing with me. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy The sun, the sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing. the Lord. in love. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will 
shall keep on singing. Ten thousand. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. On that day, sing with me. And on that day, when my strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still, still, my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand. Thousand years and then forever more. One last time, bless the Lord. Sing with me. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like this. your holy name. Thank you. You may be seated. We have 10,000 reasons to praise his name, and we have 10,000 different ways that we can praise his name. And one of those ways that we praise him is by serving him. Uh, we are in that that part of our church year in which we are looking forward to the next church year, which starts September the 1st, and uh, we are right in the middle of all the work that the nominating team does to make sure that we have all the volunteers that we need to serve in all kinds of different places throughout the church. And so I just want to remind you about these forms that are right outside this door. Uh, there may be a blue form with your name on it on the table right outside those doors. Uh, the blue forms are for those of you who are already in a volunteer position. Uh, this is to remind you what that position is and to see if you are willing to continue in that position for the coming church year. Uh, if you don't have a blue form with your name on it, then we would love for you to fill out one of these green forms. That These are for new members or for those who are not yet in an official serving capacity. If you'll just take one of these, fill it out. There's all kinds of different uh, ways that you can serve. Uh, it's not limited to what's on this paper, but there are a lot of great things to remind you here. There are also some contacts, uh, some, some, some names on here that you can find out more information about each one of these spots. Uh, so we would love for you to fill one of these out quickly. Uh, we told you in the last couple of weeks that we had a, we had a, a thank you for those who filled them out by last Sunday. Uh, a $50 Visa gift card that we drew during the week. And Micah Farmer won our gift card for the first drawing. Now, Micah is not here this morning. Micah's family is at the beach. I hear that they took a vacation because they're going to be serving so hard in the coming year that they wanted to get rested up. So, Micah, we have this for you, and we have one more gift card that we're going to give away for everybody who turns in one of these forms by two weeks from today. So if you have not yet turned one of these in, make sure that you get it in by two weeks from today. We'll have a $25 gift card uh, that we draw for that. This makes the work of the staff and the nominating team so much easier as we prepare. I do want to let you know, just because you've turned in a form doesn't mean that your praying through volunteer positions is over, because over the next several weeks, we will be pointing out some areas of high-priority service, uh, some areas that we still have some holes in, uh, that are just critical for the life of the church. So even if you have filled one of these out, we will uh, ask you to continue to pray about how the Lord would, would have you to, to serve 
in the following church year, and you can just communicate that to us uh, as we go along. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, I want to go ahead and read the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning as we continue our sermon series, uh, Making Your Home a Field of Dreams. And this morning, we are going to be learning from this passage how to play as a team. Uh, to, to borrow a phrase from Jim Putnam, uh, church is a team sport, and uh, this passage teaches us all about that. I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 16. This is what Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is God's Word to us his people as we carry out his mission, and especially as we play as a team. Uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the truth of your word. We are thankful for these baptisms that we have celebrated this morning, and another picture of the, the transformational new life that you offer for us in Christ. Uh, Father, this text reminds us that, that our walk with you doesn't end in the baptistry, it begins there, uh, it, and we are to, to walk with you in a manner which is worthy of that calling that you have placed on our life. Father, we pray this morning as we continue to worship you through song, and then as we worship you through the preaching of your word, uh, we pray that you would speak to us and that we would then speak back to you in worship. Uh, Father, change our lives this morning by the power of your spirit and the power of your word, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, one of the things, so I mentioned earlier, we talked about dreams and visions. That's something that we prayed for our friends to have. Um, that's one of the ways that, that we have noticed that God has revealed himself to them previously. Uh, the other thing I mentioned earlier was heart language. We sing in our heart language here. Um, our heart language is English, right? That's the language of our heart. It's the language that we think in. It's, it's who we have been raised to be as Americans. We speak English. To them, they speak Farsi. Their heart language is Farsi. And so we pray that God would speak to them through his word given in Farsi, making sure that they have available copies. The other thing we, we do is that we pray for them in the Jesus' name, that he would move in power in his name. And so we're going to sing a song called I Speak Jesus. This song to me speaks power. That is the only name that can heal that can save, that can deliver, that can redeem. And so this morning as we sing that, I want that to be what you're thinking about is the name of Jesus and the power that is in it 
that saved you from a life spent forever apart from him, how he has moved in your life, how he has worked in your life, in his name. So stand with me and sing. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want. I just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus. Your name. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. I just want. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear, over fear and all anxiety to everyone, to every soul held captive by depression, I speak Jesus, your name, your name is power. Your name is healing, your name is life. Break every, break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Your name, your name is power, your name. Shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus for, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Let's sing that again. Shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name is power. Let's sing that together. Your name. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know. 
Cause I know there is peace within his presence. I speak Jesus. Amen. The last song we're going to sing together is called The Old Rugged Cross. And this is a song that I think that we have to really be careful with. Because if we think of the cross itself, that's idolatry. But if we think of the man upon the cross who saved us, that's worship. That is who we have come to worship today. And so when we were in Greece, when we first got over there, I was terrified of where we were staying, of where we were, walking, John and Melina are laughing, walking from street to street. Y'all, we would see people with needles in their arm on the side of the road passed out. It was a scary place to me as someone who has never been to another country and has lived a middle to middle upper class life my whole life. Terrifying to me. And I prayed regularly that Jesus would steady my heart so that I could see what he had for me. And he did. And it was a reminder to cling to the, the, the cross of Calvary, the Christ who saved me. And so as we sing this together, um, we're going to sing two verses, just two verses. Um, and so let's sing this together. Sing with me on a hill. <clears throat> on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The voices, I will cling. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange. 
and exchange it someday for a crown. Pray with me. Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity that it is uh, to come and worship you today. Lord, may, may we never take that for granted. Uh, Father, as Ryan comes to speak, Lord, I pray that you would give him a, a clear mind and a clear heart, Father, to communicate the message of unity that you have for us today. Mm. Uh, Lord, unity in our church is so important. Um, you should be the focal point and the centerpiece of our lives and our congregation so that as we walk under that leadership and under the cross of Calvary, Lord, may we be unified in your name. Um, Father, help us to be attentive. Lord, help me to stay awake. Uh, Lord, just help us to focus this morning on the truths that you have prepared for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. A young dad was uh, looking out the kitchen window into the backyard of his home, and he was intrigued because he saw his son walking into the backyard with a baseball bat in one hand and a ball in the other hand. And so that got, got his father's attention, and he, as he was you know, doing stuff in the kitchen, he was looking out, watching to see what was going to happen out there. And so he saw his son kind of find his spot in the backyard, and he got his stance, bat in one hand, ball in the other, and he tossed the ball up, and he took a mighty swing, and the ball went right down to his feet because he completely missed. And so the dad was like, okay, he's got... He's got a couple more chances there. The, the son picked the ball up again, you know, didn't seem to be phased at all. Tossed that ball up, this time a little bit higher. Cranked himself up, swung again, and once again the ball right back down to his feet. At this, at this point, the dad was getting a little bit discouraged, you know, for the kid. And was, you know, almost praying in there. Lord, help him to, help him to hit this one so he doesn't get discouraged and give up. But sure enough, the boy took the ball again tossed it up even a little bit higher this time and took the mightiest of swings strike three ball back to his feet the dad was crushed he was thinking oh, how, how am i going to encourage my son as he comes back into the house you know kid starts to come back in dad gets a, a nice drink to greet him at the door and as soon as he opens the door the dad said son you know don't worry about it you'll get him next time and the kid looked up at him with a confused face, and he said, what are you talking about? That's the best I've pitched in my entire life. <laughs> See, baseball is a little bit different. Baseball is a team sport. It works a lot better when you got more than one person. When you only have one person, you have to get really creative in baseball. And so we're going to be seeing this morning how baseball can actually teach us a lot about life in that it is a team sport, that we, that we play this sport together. Uh, there are going to be a lot of things that we learn in Ephesians chapter 4 that I think will greatly encourage us as we continue our walk with Jesus. Hopefully by now you've already got your Bible open to the right place in Ephesians chapter 4. Incredibly important passage here. As Paul makes his transition, if you're not familiar with the book of Ephesians, for the first three chapters, Paul has been laying out theology. He's been, he's been laying out our need for Jesus. He, at the beginning of chapter 2 in particular, he talked about the fact that, that we were all dead in our sins, walking in our former way of life, but God. And God saved us through the blood of his son Jesus. And so Paul continues to, to lay that picture out he talks about the nature of the church and that God has given the church for the praise of his glory. That's a reminder that we as the church, we live together in such a way that we bring honor and praise to the Lord Jesus and that people who are not in the church can see Jesus through us. And so for three chapters, he lays out that incredible theology and then beginning in chapter four, he begins to, to turn to the more uh, practical aspects of life. How do we take all of that that we've learned in the great theology that Paul has laid out, and how do we put that to practice as we live out the Christian life? Let me redirect your attention again to Ephesians chapter 4, 
verses 1 through 3. This is where, where Paul says, I therefore, uh, therefore, in, in, in response to all that I have written to you about salvation that is found in Christ and the purpose for the church, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. As we, as we look at this passage this morning and as we think about what it means to play as a team, the first thing that we realize is that means unity. That God has called us together. Uh, we see that very, very clearly in those those first few verses where Paul is saying that, that we are to walk in humility with one another. We are to walk in patience with one another. We are to live out this calling. Uh, notice he says in verses 4 through 6, he talks more about that unity and, and where that is established. He said there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. We have to play as a team. Church is a team sport. Salvation is a team sport. Notice the repetition in verse 1 there. Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you. Now, it doesn't really come across in English, but the the, the Greek word behind that command, I urge you, is, is the command for calling alongside. I encourage you. I call alongside in you. And so he's saying, I call alongside for you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. That's the second appearance of that root calling to which you have been called. Three times... In that first verse, Paul is reminding us that the Christian life is not just a one-time decision for Christ, but it is a calling that we walk in for the rest of our life. And then specifically, as we think about this unity, we see in this passage that we are called to life together in the church. We are called to life together, as I was uh, kind of proofreading my notes last night, I, I wondered if maybe that was a, a typo, that we are, maybe it was supposed to say that we are called to live together. But no, we are called to do life together. We are called to a life together in the church. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer has an incredible book by that same title, Life Together, which is a look at the gift of Christian community. God has called us together. That's, that's one thing that I like about this ongoing uh, illustration of baseball because baseball is a team sport. In order to really play baseball, you got to have more than one person. I mean, you can work on some skills by yourself, as we saw from that boy who was trying to hit that ball. You can, you can uh, string up a tire in the backyard and you can try to throw through that tire. You can possibly hit the ball off of a tee, but really to get better at baseball. And, and to do baseball correctly, it takes a number of people. To work on most skills, it takes two or three people. Somebody to hit a ground ball or pop flies. Somebody uh, to play at first base so you can work on making those throws to the right place. It, it takes a number of people. To play a game-like scenario, I, I think it takes at least ten people. You've got to have nine people out in the field. You've got to have somebody hitting. Of course, then you've got to have somebody running the bases. So really... To play any kind of real team scenario in baseball, it takes 12 or 13 people. And then we all know that in order to play a real game, it takes at least 18 people because baseball is a team sport, just like church is a team sport. God did not intend for any of us to live out this Christian life by ourselves. He has given us the gift of the church as He brings us together and we demonstrate that unity. You know, we had baptism this morning. And baptism, as I was saying with, with Alyssa, baptism is a picture on the outside of what has already happened on the inside. But baptism is also the official entryway 
into the church. When you have been saved by the blood of Jesus, you demonstrate that with your baptism and you join the church. Maybe, maybe you're here today and watching those baptisms has reminded you that you need to join the church. You need to join the team this morning because God has gifted us with this team together that we are to display unity in the body. And so playing as a team certainly means unity, but that's not all. Look at verse 7. After Paul has laid out this calling for unity, verse 7 says, but... So the first word in English, second word in Greek because of grammar rules, the first word there is but, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Focus on that word grace. Because Paul has already talked a great deal about grace and how that is the necessary component in the Christian life. We think about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, which is this, this incredible picture of salvation and this, this reminder that salvation is not in result to anything that we can do for God. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 says that by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. That is, that is Paul reminding us that, that salvation is not anything that we can earn. We don't earn salvation by coming to church more often. We don't earn salvation by trying harder to do better. We don't, we don't earn salvation through kingdom service. Salvation is a gift that has been purchased for us on that old rugged cross that we just sang about a few moments ago. The only way to join the team of God's family is to receive the grace of God, to admit to Jesus that you're a sinner, that you need the salvation that only He can provide, and to accept His grace. So in Ephesians 2, Paul talks about that grace in terms of salvation, but here in chapter 4, he uses that term grace in terms of how we live out our Christian life. He says, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And then he quotes from Psalm 68, 18. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Paul there is quoting from Psalm 68, 18. And I think it's fascinating when we think about that psalm. Because typically in the life of the Jewish people, in the life of the Israelites, they would use Psalm 68 as they celebrated the feast of Pentecost. Now when we think about Pentecost, we think about Acts chapter 2 and what happened when God poured out His Holy Spirit. But Pentecost was already a feast of God's people. And so every year when the feast of Pentecost rolled around, Psalm 68 is one of the psalms that the people would use as they celebrated the fact that God had given them the law. And so in this psalm, when it talks about ascending on high and giving gifts, it is primarily talking about Moses who has ascended onto, uh, onto the mountain and received the law from the Lord. And notice how Paul now takes that imagery and uses it to the ascended Jesus who gives gifts to those who are in the church. I think it's a fascinating contrast because Psalm 68 had been a celebration of the law at Pentecost, but then because of what happened on the day of Pentecost, when God rained down the Holy Spirit onto His church, Paul now uses that imagery to remind us that God has given every one of us grace in the form of spiritual gifts and talents and abilities and availability for His church. It is a reminder that not only is unity required to play as a team, but playing as a team requires diversity. We have to be a diverse people if we are going to play together as a team to bring honor and glory to the Lord through the church. Paul talks about that diversity in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when he's talking about spiritual gifts. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verses 4 through 7. He says, There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. 
There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Playing as a team requires diversity. You think about that on a baseball team. Think about all the different skills that have to come together for a baseball team to be successful. You need people that are going to hit the ball well. You need some who are going to hit the ball well just to get on base and have a high on-base percentage, but you're also going to need to have some on your team who hit for power if you want to be successful. So you need good hitters on your team. You need slick fielders. You need somebody who can play shortstop and, and make those difficult plays. You need somebody who can play center field and run down those balls that are hit into the gap. And you need pitchers as well, right? You need all kinds of different skills in order to make a baseball team successful. You know, baseball scouts talk about a five-tool player. Uh, a five-tool player is somebody that, that hits well for average, hits well for power, runs fast, fields well, and throws the ball hard. That is a five-tool player, and there aren't many players that have all of those tools because you, you see diversity on a baseball team. In fact, not only do you need those five tools, but you need somebody who can, who can get on the pitcher's mound and control the game. And as far as I know, there's only one player in the entire Major League Baseball system that does all of those things pretty well. His name is Shohei Otani. He plays for the Los Angeles Angels, and he is an incredibly rare player because he has all of those tools. But most teams need lots of different people to have those particular skills so the team can be successful. And the same can be said for the church. There aren't many of us, certainly not me, who have all of those gifts. One thing about the body of Christ, the church is called the body of Christ because as we are assembled together, we bring all the different pieces of the body together and then we get to have a picture of what the Lord Jesus is really like. None of us can be an accurate depiction of what Jesus is like by ourselves. But as we celebrate the diversity that God has given us, different backgrounds, different talents, different spiritual gifts, all coming together to exhibit the body of Christ, showing that through diversity. We are gifted and equipped individually for the church. Notice that we are called to life together in the church, but we are gifted and equipped individually for the church. Do you remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 7? That to each is given a manifestation for the common good. That means that God has given us gifts not so we can feel better about ourselves, not because He wants us to fill our spiritual trophy cases, he has given us those gifts. He has given diversity within the body for the common good because He wants us to be gifted and equipped for the church. Let me explain what that means for you, church. That means that, that what gifts and talents and abilities God has given you, He has given those to you for the people that are around you. He has given those to you so you can take those gifts and abilities and talents and availability and put them into practice so that all of us can be equipped for the good of the church. Um, I love 2 Peter 1.3 because it talks about how that diversity comes together. 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Uh, I memorized that in the NIV, that, that His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And Ephesians chapter 4 is a reminder that much of what God has given us is in the form of the people of the church. That's a huge part of what God has given us as all of those diverse talents and abilities and spiritual gifts come together. He has given us those uh, for life and godliness. But you'll notice in this passage that there is a particular 
destination. There is a particular reason that God has given us these individual giftings. Notice what Paul says in verses 11 and 12. Uh, after he has said that, that each of us has been given gifts, he begins to narrow that down and be even more specific. In verse 11, he says, He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. There's that reminder there that, that the, the reason God has gifted you is so that you can bring those gifts to the local church for the building up of the body of Christ, but then notice what the destination is. Notice what the purpose is. Verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. Playing as a team means unity and diversity, but for the purpose of maturity. God has given us the church because He wants all of us to grow up in Christ. You know, as we, as we have a baptism, we celebrate new life in Christ. But we celebrate that new life in Christ as the beginning point of a life that is going to continue to grow up eventually into the fullness of the measure of Christ because God is looking for maturity. And every one of us needs that maturity. And Paul spells out why we need that maturity in our life and specifically in this world in which we live. Notice what he says in verse 14. Here's the reason that we need that maturity. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. We need maturity because the world is working against us. The world is trying to pull us in the wrong direction. The world is trying to challenge those things that we know to be true because we've, taught, we've been taught those things in the church. That's why we need maturity. And notice that God uses all of us to mature us together in Christ. The church working together helps us grow up in Christ. That's the reason that you need the church. One of the things that one of the things you are saying when you join a church is you are saying, I need help. I can't do this by myself. I can't grow up in Christ by myself. And so I need people who will teach me God's word. I need gifted Sunday school teachers. I need gifted mentors. I, I need the preaching of the word. I, I need places that I can put my gifts into service because none of us are going to mature in Christ without doing something. And just like when you go to, to lift weights, you, you get stronger by doing something, by pumping up those, those muscles in the body. And so we need that maturity. The church working together helps us to grow up in Christ. That's why Paul says in verses 15 and 16, that rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. Listen to this part. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Listen, we don't, we don't hand out green forms and blue forms just because we want to have a nominating team report that is full. We, we hand out green forms and blue forms. We hand out those serve it out forms because God has made it very, very clear that only when the church is working together are we going to be maturing in Christ. Are we going to be growing up into the head that is Jesus? And so I really want to challenge, challenge you this morning. If, if you're one of those people that church for you has primarily meant coming and sitting in the sanctuary or even in a Sunday school class on a Sunday morning, if that has been your primary church experience, I would challenge you this morning to grow up in Christ and to demonstrate your desire for that by taking those diverse gifts and talents and abilities 
that God has given you and perhaps nobody else in this whole church and putting them to use for His glory. Some of you are, are like a gifted baseball player who, who has unique talents and abilities but, but never wants to get into the game. And so I want to challenge you to take those gifts that God has given you. Take those life experiences that God has given you and, and let's all work together so that we can all grow up in Christ. It's hard work to grow up. It doesn't happen automatically. In fact, listen to this quote from Eugene Peterson in his book, Practice Resurrection, which is uh, basically an exposition of the book of Ephesians. Eugene Peterson says, Becoming mature takes a long time, with many rest stops along the way. It cannot be hurried. It's not going to happen overnight. But notice also what he says about our particular culture. He says, America in the 21st century does not offer propitious conditions. Now, I had to look that one up, by the way. That means that in America in the 21st century, it's not easy. There aren't good conditions for growing up because maturity is not the hallmark of our culture. Our culture does not encourage us to grow up. Our culture might as well still be a Toys R Us culture. I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. That's what our culture encourages us to do. We, and, and if anything, we have, a, we have a microwave culture that thinks that if you want to grow up, if you want to mature, if you want to get better, that everything can just happen in an instant. But that's not the way maturity works. If you want to grow up in Christ, you have to make a decision. You have to choose, number one, to join the team. Some of you may be here this morning, and, and, and maybe, maybe you've thought you were on the team, but really you've just been sitting in the stands watching everybody else who is on the team because you've never actually given your life to Christ. Anne is a, a great picture of what it looks like to realize that you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, and that can happen this morning as you join the team. And then you can continue to, to participate in that team by taking your gifts and your talents and your abilities and deciding that you're not just going to come and, and sit and watch other people do all the work, but, but you're going to grow up in Christ by, receive, by realizing that the opportunities you have to serve are a gift that God has given you because it's a great way to grow up in Christ. Maturity requires a decision. I saw an awesome tweet this week. It had nothing to do with baseball. It had nothing to do with Ephesians chapter 4. But right there, out of the blue, I saw this guy who said, getting older is not the same thing as maturing. And I thought, wow, that, that will preach right there. Because some of us in Christ, we're getting older, but we're not really maturing. What I mean by that, some of us have known Jesus for years, maybe even decades. But having more birthdays in Christ is not the same as growing up in Christ. Maturity is a decision that we have to make. It's a decision to join the team. It's a decision to play as a team using our diverse gifts and deciding that we're going to look more like Jesus this year than we ever have before. And God can help us with that. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are thankful that church is a team sport. Lord, I'm thankful that, that you haven't called anybody to do everything. But you have called everybody to do something. Father, we thank you for the diverse people that you've called together. Lord, in this room joining us online this morning. There are all kinds 
of different people from different backgrounds. Some of us who have grown up in church and we've been hearing this stuff our whole life. Others who maybe this is still very, very new. We thank you for the diversity that we see in Christ. We thank you for the diversity that we see here in this local body of Christ. And Father, we're thankful that by the power of the cross, you can take all of that diversity and bring it together with unity. Lord, we're thankful that the command for us this morning has not been that we are to achieve that unity because there's really nothing we can do to achieve unity. That that unity has been provided for us, purchased on that old rugged cross that we sang about just a few minutes ago. So Lord, your command for us this morning is not to achieve that unity, but to maintain that unity. And Lord, we know that sometimes sometimes that means forgiveness. All the time that means humility and patience, bearing with one another. Father, I pray that you would grow us together in Christ. I pray that as the, as the outside world sees this body here at Utica, that they would see a people who love each other and are experiencing the unity that you have given us in Christ. But Father, we're thankful also for the diversity that you've given. Thank you for all the different talents and abilities and spiritual gifts and backgrounds that you have given every one of us so that we can come together to serve you in your kingdom for your glory and for our common good. Father, I pray if there's anybody here today who has primarily been a bystander, not really using the gifts that you've given. Father, I pray that, that this call today would get us up off the bench, working together for your glory. Uh, Lord, we're thankful that you use those things to grow us up in Christ. We, we know that is, that is a picture of your goodness. And so, Father, we celebrate that right now. We, we thank you that, that through the goodness of your Son, Jesus, through the grace that He provides to us, that we can walk in newness of life in a manner worthy of the calling that we have received, and that you can use us to bring people closer to Jesus. Father, we celebrate that goodness now, and we pray that you would move in us that we might serve you well. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So part of God's goodness to me is the church. You know, I can't honestly say that I have been through a time of my life where the church hasn't been important to me. I can't say that there's been a time where, um, you know, a body of believers around me hasn't been important. Community means so much to me. Um, the people that, that Christ has placed around me. And so in this season of my life, that community is all of you because I just moved here. You know, I'm, I'm still getting to know people in the area, but you guys have taken me in. You have made me a part of your family. You have allowed me to grow already and will continue to allow me to grow. Maturing, right? I'm 29. I'm 29 now. Um, but that's part of my spiritual journey is ministering to all of you. And God has allowed me to be a pastor here and to be able to love each of you as you love me. We're a family. That's God's goodness to me. The gift of you all to me is a blessing. Just like First Baptist was a gift to me, this congregation is a gift to me. And you guys are going to teach me so many different things than I, than I already know in my life. Just like I'm going to teach you some stuff. It's going to be crazy, okay? But it's God's goodness allowing me to be here with all of you right now in my dazed and confused state. So let's stand together and sing about the goodness of God. Sing with me. I love you, Lord.
For your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I have seen the goodness of God All my life all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that i am able i will sing of the goodness of god i love I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness is running after. Sing with me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after sing with me your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down i surrender now i give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me one last time, just voices, all my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life. All my life you have been so, so good. With every, with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Thank you. You can be seated for just a moment. We will call these up one at a time. Isn't the Lord good? Isn't it great to see so many people responding and uh, participating in the life of the church? I'll ask Ann to come and stand with me first. Uh, you've already seen her this morning. This is Ann Hainish. Got saved here on May the 1st. Got baptized just a few moments ago. Uh, if you would rejoice and receive Ann officially into the family of our church, would you let her know that by saying, praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. I don't know if, uh, is Alyssa in here? All right, she's at kids worship, but you just go ahead and stay here, Ann. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just form a line. Even though Alyssa is at kids worship, uh, we can also receive her into the life of the church. So if you would rejoice in what God has done in the life of Alyssa Smith and welcome her into the Utica family. Uh, let her and her parents know that by saying, praise the Lord. Praise 
Lord. All right, next I'll ask for Stan and Lynn Sears to come and stand by Ann Hainish. Stan and Lynn have been attending our church for a few months now, and uh, I had the privilege of visiting with them in my office a few weeks back and and hearing of all the ways that God has used them. Uh, they've kind of lived in different parts of the country, but one of the neat things about moving around is you see that God has a church everywhere, right? They've been in lots of different church families and have served Him in a variety of ways. They both have a relationship with Christ. They both have been baptized by immersion, and they believe this is the place that God would have them to continue to grow in the Lord. So if you would receive Stan and Lynn Sears into the family of our church, would you let them know by saying, praise the Lord. Lord. I'm going to ask for the Johnsons to come and stand by them. Uh, You recognize this family. It it is Bailey Beth in particular that is coming forward this morning the way it was told to me a few seconds ago. uh, She has already joined God's team, and now she wants to join our team specifically here. So recently, Bailey Beth gave her heart to Jesus She prayed to receive Christ, and she's been uh, exploring what that means, and and now she's ready to make that public profession of her faith in Christ and be baptized and officially be a member of this family. So if you would rejoice with Bailey Beth Johnson, would you let her know that by saying, "Praise praise the Lord. And then finally, Patsy McDonough comes today. Patsy, you can come and stand on this side. Uh, Thank you for not putting me before. <laughs> by the tall guy. You can, you can come stand by the short guy on this end. All right. Uh, so Pat, uh, Patsy and her husband Larry back there have been attending our church for uh, a few months now. And uh, we had the privilege of uh, visiting with Patsy uh, a week or so ago in my office and getting to hear about all the ways that God has already moved in her life. Uh, how God is using her to uh, disciple and grow her kids and her grandkids. Uh, She's got a great story to tell. Uh, She has a relationship with Christ, and she has been She's been baptized uh, a couple of times. She, she made me promise I wasn't going to make her get baptized again. She's been baptized in a river yeah. and in the ocean, but never in a really hot baptistry. So yeah. maybe we got one more to go. <laughs> <No> more. <laughs> if you would rejoice with Patsy McDonough that God has brought her here to the Utica family, would you let her know that by saying praise the Lord? All right, I'm going to let all of y'all have a seat. And in just a moment, we would love to have y'all out in the main lobby because there are people that would love to uh, get to know you a little bit better and congratulate you and welcome you into the family. I think we have, what, two anniversaries to celebrate today. And this is one of the things I love about the church because you see diversity even as we celebrate anniversaries. So we have Brett and Heather Campbell who have been married for 10 years And then we have Jim and Peg Jernigan, who have been married for 70 years. So let's give God, uh, let's give give both of them a hand as they continue. Uh, just Just a few reminders. We have a senior adult lunch this Tuesday. We're going to have a representative from the Martha Franks Retirement Community. That's one of the South Carolina Baptist Convention retirement communities. So they're going to be here on Tuesday. Uh, to to give us some more information about that ministry, uh, bring sides and a dessert to share with other people who were there. That's uh, Tuesday at 11. Tonight, we have our quarterly business meeting at 5 o'clock. We have a lot of stuff to do. We'll go over financial reports. We're also going to finalize that bylaws amendment that we've been talking about for a couple of weeks now. Uh, You can find copies of that at each one of the music stands if you have not had a chance to look at that yet. And then as we go today, we are going to be praying for those who are going to Kids Salt. Uh, It says under your prayer items there that it's Monday through Friday. It's actually Monday through Thursday. Uh, I'm going to try to blame that on Travis and his not thinking clearly, even though it was even though it was clearly me. So Monday through Thursday is Kids Salt. Those of you who are going to Kids Salt as students or chaperones, um, most of them might be in kids worship. Do we have any of those here in the room? We have one here in the room, two. All right, y'all just stand up where you are for about five seconds, and then we'll have everybody join you, okay? Joe and Ella and Timothy Pitts, Kimberly Dover back there, and then lots of people who are back there. So let's all stand together, and we will pray for those who are headed out. Uh, Just like our youth went to Charleston Southern a few weeks ago, now our kids 
have their turn, and we know God is going to do great things in their life. And so let's pray for them as we go. Heavenly Father, we rejoice with all that you're continuing to do here. Uh, Father, we thank you for these new lives in Christ that we have celebrated this morning with, with baptism. We thank you for new members into the Utica family. Uh, you're making us more and more diverse with lots of different gifts. And Father, we just thank you for the privilege of serving you. Thank you that we can use those gifts and talents and abilities that you've given us to serve your kingdom so that all of us can continue to grow in Christ. Uh, Father, we specifically pray for our group that's going to Kid Salt tomorrow. Uh, we thank you for the incredible things that happen regularly at, at summer camp. And Father, we pray that that would be the case for our group as well. We have a few in that group who have not made a public profession of faith in your son Jesus. Uh, Father, we pray that you would use this week very powerfully uh, to help them see who Jesus is and to see their need for Christ. And Father, we pray that we might have some salvations in our group. Uh, Lord, for those who are traveling down there who have who have already been saved, we pray that it would be an incredible time of maturity. Uh, Lord, that they would grow in Christ and begin to to see more and more of how you want to work in their life. So, Father, we pray for safe travel. We pray for health throughout the week. We pray for patience and energy for our chaperones. We thank you for their uh, desire to go and to build into the lives of our kids. And, Father, we pray that you would just use all of us in many, many different ways in all of the places that you will send us this week. Use us to bring people closer to Jesus. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Y'all have a great afternoon.